afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another DXO webinar. I'm your host, Photo Joseph. And before we get too far, let's just make sure that you can see and hear me okay. You should be seeing me, hearing me, and seeing my screen right now. You may be able to adjust your ratio of me versus the demo screen on your system. Everybody's saying good, thumbs up. We're all good here. Excellent. Thank you very much. And so if you want to make me a little smaller, a little bigger, you do have that control on your end of things. Um, I will uh, I will be keeping an eye on the comments as closely as possible. If you haven't attended one of my webinars before, the way that I do things is I endeavor to answer questions as they come up. I don't just wait until the end. So basically anytime that there's a natural break in the demo or it just feels like I've been talking too long, I will jump over to the questions and see what's there. So if you have any questions at any time, feel free to drop them in there. If for any reason you don't get your question answered, either I miss it or you just don't think of it until later on, feel free to hit me up on social media. I love to try and help you out there. The best places to reach me are Twitter and Instagram. You can also find me on YouTube. And in fact, I'm going to drop into the chat room right now a couple of URLs for you, my Twitter, my Instagram, and my YouTube. Um, you know, Follow, subscribe, all those good things there. And if you have questions, just hit me up on any of those. Twitter is generally the best for any kind of question about this, um, about any of the webinars you've seen today. Um, let's see here. I guess that's pretty much it. We're just going to head right in. So today's topic is all about noise reduction, but specifically it's localized noise reduction. The idea being that noise reduction, let's just face it, has gotten really, really good, both in camera and in software. I mean, if you go back, I don't know, let's say five years ago, 10 years, let's go back 10 years ago, and you talk about the DSLRs that we had back then, the files that came out at 1600 ISO were pretty grainy. And then you kind of had to use noise reduction software. And Define, what we're going to be working with today from uh, from the NIC collection, has been around for a while. And it was, back then, it was a really, really good solution. And today, the cameras that we have today, first of all, can shoot at much higher ISO before you ever even need to think about external noise reduction, right? A lot of that noise reduction is happening in camera to begin with, just better quality sensors. If you're shooting JPEG, then that noise reduction is actually happening in the camera. But uh, if you're shooting raw, the noise reduction happens in software, but the file that you get is just infinitely cleaner than it was a decade ago. Now you get into the software itself, just your general apps, whether you're talking about using Photolab or Lightroom or Photoshop or any of these other, even Apple Photos, even any of these general tools that we have today for raw processing, do a really good job of noise reduction. Uh, things like color noise, which we'll actually see a feature for in here, but doesn't actually really seem to do anything. I mean, we don't need it because there just isn't really color noise anymore. Uh, it's something that's almost been completely eliminated in the modern workflow. But general noise, just getting some of that general noise out of the way is still something that we do want to do. And if you take a single approach, single heavy-handed approach to it, you have an image that will take a single amount of noise reduction, whether it's high or low, just, gonna just call it high, medium, and low for now. You put a high level of noise reduction on it, and the soft background looks great, but the subject looks all mushy and plasticky. So you dial the noise reduction down to a more minimal setting, and suddenly the skin tone looks awesome, but you know there's a lot of noise in the background that you'd like to get rid of. So what we can do with Define is localize that noise reduction, make it very precise, and put it exactly where we want. And it, it goes beyond that even from the very beginning, but that's the general summary of what we're going to be doing today. So uh, real quick into the Q&A, make sure there's nothing popping up in here. Um, oh yeah, guys, okay, so I'm seeing, some of you were talking about how the registration for the SilverFX Pro webinar didn't work. Three email blasts when I just learned this this morning or last night. Three email blasts went out from DxO. One of them had the wrong URL for the black and white register, the Silver Effects Pro webinar, which is on Monday, I think. If that URL doesn't work for you, I can tell you exactly what's wrong. Somebody got an extra nine at the end of it. So just copy that URL from the newsletter to your clipboard, paste it into a web browser, and delete that last nine, and it will work. So give that a try. Sorry about that. I think they're going to email blast everyone again with a correct one, but in the meantime, you can certainly do that. Um, Thomas wants, is asking about prime noise reduction. We're not talking about prime noise reduction in today's webinar. Today's webinar is specifically about Define. I did a prime noise reduction one earlier, which is probably now on the YouTube channel, so you can look for that. All righty. And let's see, anything else real quick before I go in? And, uh, oh, Ernie's got a great question to start with. Is it better to do noise reduction on the raw file, for instance, using 
for instance, using Photoshop Lightroom or later using Nick Define? That's a really good question. So the base level of noise reduction, what happens in the raw decode, there's really no way around that. You could turn it down to a, a minimal setting, and I suppose you'd really have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis, whether you wanted to, um, sorry, my phone, my watch is beeping at me like crazy. Let's put that on Do Not Disturb. Um, you would have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis, try it out, and see what gets you a better result if dialing it way down in raw and then doing more in defined versus the other way around. I would generally, though, recommend letting the raw decoder do its own base level noise reduction. Don't crank it up any higher. Just let it do what it does and then take it from there into defined. That would be the workflow that I would recommend. And, and I got to be honest with you, you know, the the workflow that we're looking at today is pretty specific, pretty precise, and really is only necessary on those really high ISO photos that you really, really care about, right? Because noise reduction is so good just in general, for the most part, you probably don't need to go any farther than what you're getting out of your raw decode or maybe just sliding the slider around a little bit to do a little bit more, a little bit less if that's your taste. Um, this, what we're looking at today, is pretty specific. This is not something you're going to want to do for every photo. This is something you do for those special images that you really want to take to that next level, either because you're going to print it really big, it's particularly important to you, maybe it's a you know, super important client photo that you need to give them the absolute best possible quality, whatever the reason may be, but this is not something you're going to do to every photo out there. Okay, um, at this point, I'm going to jump into the demo and we'll come back to the questions later on. We're going to work almost entirely with this photo today. So I am starting in Photoshop. I'm gonna base this out of Photoshop, although um, it doesn't really matter for some of what we're doing where we're going, but the advantage for using Photoshop, for those who haven't seen this before, is with Photoshop, I can apply this filter, the define, uh, define filter as a smart filter, which allows me certain flexibilities farther down the road. Um, but for the most part, what we're doing here, it doesn't really matter what tool we're using to start with. So this is the photo. This is, let's see here, uh, 51,200 ISO. So a very high ISO photo to begin with. If I zoom in, let's just get a little bit closer here. We can start to see some of the noise in there. So there's clearly a fair amount of noise in here. The base noise reduction is already applied. This is just default camera raw, but there's clearly a fair amount of noise in there to deal with. So that's something that we're gonna wanna fix. I'm not gonna do any adjustments inside of camera raw. And this is an important part of this process. You want to do the vast majority of your effects, your color grading, your special effects looks, or whatever you're doing after you do your noise reduction. Now, because noise reduction has to happen after the raw decode, there is certain things, there are certain things that you do want to do before you leave the raw decode room. And in this case, it's going to be, now this photo doesn't need it, but in this case, it would be things like highlight or shadow recovery. You want to get as much detail into the scene as possible because we are gonna be working in a post-raw workflow. So if you have recovery that you need to do, I mean, in this photo, you can see up here, it is clipping some blacks. And so you could argue that, well, it should lift up the shadow detail in there, but I don't actually want to. Um, this photo, I like the way it is right now, so I'm just gonna leave it. But whatever the photo might be, let's say that you've got a, um, a wedding dress. You know, you've got your classic white wedding dress and it was shot indoors, high ISO, and you blew the highlights because you overexposed it. Do pull that down at this stage before moving on. I think that's a pretty important thing to, to consider. But in this case, I'm just gonna leave it as it is. Um, I am actually going to first just click on open image, which means it's going to open as a rendered file. This is now, this is no longer raw. I cannot get back to the raw decode. This is a pixel-based file at this point. And the reason that I'm doing this, which is not how I would normally work in Photoshop, but the reason that I'm doing this is because I wanna show you one of the tools that we have access to in the, this goes for all the Nick plugins, but it's quite useful, I think, for the uh, for Define. And that is the palette that lives, it pops up automatically every time you open Photoshop until you tell it not to. Um, if you've closed it, it lives under File, Automate, and right here, Nick Collection Selective Tool. And if you haven't seen this palette before, well, if you've installed these and launched Photoshop, you've definitely seen it before um, and probably gone, will this thing please go away? Incidentally, if you wanna make it go away, click on Settings and uh, where is it? when Photoshop launches, do not automatically open. You can set it to that, which is what I have it to. If you want it, then I just showed you how to get to that. Okay, what this does, 
just on brief is it applies basic filter effects, basic NIC filter effects without going into the interface. It just applies it and then allows you to mask between the affected version and the unaffected version. And for the most part, I don't ever use this. I'm not interested in this, but it's kind of cool how it works with define. So I'm just going to shrink this up a little bit so it takes up just a little bit less space. Oh, that reminds me. Let me very quickly make my mouse cursor a little bit bigger for you. So that's a little easier to see. I always forget to do that before we start. There we go. Okay, um, what I've got in here, oh, and just <laughs> now that I've made that cursor bigger, it makes my brush abnormally bigger, which is why I don't like using it. So my brush size now looks bigger than it actually is. Anyway, um, so what this does is it allows me to apply a, it's called a default or a generic noise reduction setting for things like, as it says here, background or hot pixels or fine structures or skin or sky and so on. So there's a few kind of presets. So this image here, let's break this into two parts, uh, or the background, the blue, gray, blue wall in the background, and then his skin tone. Those are the two things I'm concerned with right now. So if I click on background, what this does, takes a moment to process, it is going to render out a new layer, a duplicate layer, and render out a, a level of noise reduction that is ideal for the background. So for areas that are less important, don't have high detail, possibly out of focus because it's a blurry background, whatever it may be. So it's applying a much heavier version of the filter. Now, this when you use this palette, this tool comes up next, which is now largely irrelevant. This is a paint and fill tool that will control the mask. And you can see on here that my mask is currently black. If I was to put on, you click on erase here, that's already where it is. It's, it's kind of erased that whole uh, mask there. If I click fill, this goes to white. It's now filled the mask. And I, this is fine, but you can do the same thing by just switching between a black and white paintbrush. So I'm going to just say apply that. Let's get rid of this tool palette now. And I'm just going to use standard Photoshop tools to brush this in and out. So let me go to 100%, pan over here a bit. And this is, I'm going to rename this layer. Let's call this background so we don't um, we don't lose track of things. And we're going to call this original. So if I toggle this background layer on and off, okay, background noise reduced layer on and off, you can see quite heavy noise reduction that is a bit too heavy for the skin. Okay, but this is by design. The idea here is that you now grab the um, the palette here, the the mask, excuse me, and now I, okay, I'm just, I'm sorry guys who are having a hard time seeing the mouse when I make it smaller, but I just, I have to make it smaller for most of today's demo because I have to have accurate brush sizes. Um, what I want to do is either paint in the background or paint out the foreground. In this case, I'm going to paint out the foreground. So I've already got black selected. I would change my brush size. It's not, not making it too soft in here. And I would brush out this portion of the scene. So I'm protecting the skin. And obviously I would do this over the whole thing. I'm not going to waste your time with that. I'm just going to give you a little demo of it. So I paint that in. So now what I've got is you can see the mask that I've just painted in there. I am looking at on the top layer here, just the background of the photo and, and come back here. You that's just the background of the photo. And re reveal the original behind it. We're seeing the original noisy version. And then this very heavily noise reduced foreground version. Now I can take it a step further, grab that background, grab that original again, Let's go back into the automate tool. I'll do this again with the skin preset. It's gonna do the same thing. Duplicate that background layer, apply a generic skin acceptable noise reduction layer to this and go ahead and apply that and close that little guy. And now let's hide the background noise reduced and let's toggle off the difference between the skin version and the original. And it is, oh, it is, oh, what? I forgot I have to invert the mask on there. There we go. And it is, as you can see, some noise reduction, but less than what we had from the background layer, right? So this is the idea that you build up different layers representing different levels of noise reduction. So let's call this one skin. And now in this case, let's invert this mask so that we have um, none of that being applied. And now I could go in here with my brush, make that a white brush on there and now I can brush in the skin. And so now I've got one type of noise reduction applied to the skin. So let's just hide all this. There's the noise just on the skin. I got one type of noise reduction on the background. And then of course the original photo showing up in between. So this is one way to go about doing it. Now this is, this is particularly effective if you're working with a JPEG file. 
Um, this is effective for quick fixes. Maybe you just want to do a quick little noise reduction on a face. You don't want to mess around with the tools. You just want to jump into it. Um, but for the most part, this is a more older workflow that is a little bit less necessary, but it's still interesting to see how it works. Now, remember, I did all this to a already rendered out file, no longer a raw file. Let me just close this version and open up the same photo again. And this time I'm going to hold on the shift key when I click on open. So it goes from open image to open object. And this is now opening it as a smart object, which means I can go back into the raw file at any time. It also means that the filters are going to be applied as smart filters. But there's a caveat here. I'm going to do the exact same thing that I just did. I suppose I should stop closing this palette, shouldn't I? Let's bring that tool back up. I'm going to go in here and apply. We'll just do the background one. It is now going to do the same thing. However, it is actually going to apply it as what appears to be a smart filter. And it kind of is, and it kind of isn't. So I hit apply. And actually, I think I'm finally done with this palette. I am going to close it. And you see it shows up here, background filter, it labeled it background. There's my mask in there, the mask between the smart filters. And I can now go in here. And if we zoom in close, you can see that it is all being applied. I could grab the brush on here. Let's switch that to black and brush that out just as we did before. And you might think this is really cool because what I could do now is double click on this background layer, open it up into define and edit it because it's a smart filter. Maybe I want to make it a little bit more, a little bit less. You would think that, but you can't. So this is not a normal application of the filter. It's something different. And if I double click on this, which should open it, all it actually does is duplicate it. So this doesn't work for that. Um, again, it is a perfectly valid way to go if you just want to do a quick correction on the background, on the skin or whatever. You want to brush it in. That's a perfectly fine way to work, but it is less useful than it used to be. But I just wanted to show you the options that are there. But with all that said, let's get rid of these smart filters, go back to our original image as a smart object, and finally get into the filter itself. So I'm going to go ahead and launch Define and pop over to the comments real quick to see what's going on. Um, so, okay, so someone talking about the Silver Effects webinar link. The link that you've got in the mail is a Google link. Click on it. It's going to take you to a page that says this webinar doesn't exist. Look at that URL and delete the last digit off of it. Sorry. Okay. Um, let's see here. Ray Nichols saying, with the iPhone 11 Pro Max using an app for RAW, are the images good enough to use DxO software? Well, DxO software doesn't care where the image comes from or how good it is to begin with. It'll just make it better. So I would say, yeah, by all means, give it a, give it a try. Give it a go. Okay. All right. So oh, filter still processing. Oh, there we go. Let me zoom out of this. And let's start with a quick interface tour. This is, of course, a Nick plugin, so it will look very familiar to those of you who have played with it before, and I'm sure that would include most of you. Uh, I'm going to go through just a quick tour of everything that's here, and we'll dive into the the specifics of it. To start off, up in the top left corner, you have your views, which go from your normal view to a split screen before and after to a side by side before and after. When you're in this view, you can toggle whether you're looking at up top to bottom, which is particularly useful once you zoom in to 100% on here. This is a really cool way to be able to see a difference between the before and after. And so on the left here, we are seeing the original image that came from Photoshop and on the right we're seeing the noise reduced version of this picture and this is all automatically applied we obviously haven't done anything specific to it yet this is just what you get straight out of the box which is pretty darn good um, but we're just gonna leave it there for now okay so we've got that um, we go back to the regular view you can also toggle that preview on and off so if you want to get rid of it all over the whole thing here in this mode window let me zoom back out on this mode menu rather you can view the entire picture, the RGB picture. You can view the individual red, green, and blue channels, which can be interesting if you're finding noise being, you're having some hard time getting rid of some noise. You may discover that the noise is living primarily in one channel over another. You can't actually manipulate those channels individually from here, but it can still be interesting to see. And I suppose if you wanted to get really crazy about it, Actually, I never tried this. I don't know if it would work if you separated out the channels in Photoshop, brought the channels in individually. Never actually tried that. I suppose it's worth it's worth exploring, but it's more of a point of interest. You can also see the uh, just the image's luminance, the chrominance, so the color values of the image, and then you have these noise mask views in here, which we'll get into later uh, because uh, there's nothing being applied there yet. 
Okay, let's get back to the RGB mode of this. Uh, finally, over here, you've got your standard arrow tool for selecting things, your zoom in and out tool, your hand panning tool, and then you can change the background color if you so desire here. All right, the meat of this tool is right here. Under the noise reduction menu, you have two tabs, measure and reduce. By measure, the default setting is automatic, and there's something really, really interesting happening here. Notice these little boxes that have shown up over the image. I didn't place these. This is completely automated. The software looked at the picture, broke it down into different components, different color values, different noise levels, whatever it determined, and thought, well, this is an area I need to pay attention to, and this is an area, and this is an area, and so on. So it paid attention to skin tone, good, the yellow strap it saw as something unique, okay? The brown shirt, the blue background, and a little bit down here in the darkest of shadows. And it has taken all of this information and evaluated the noise in these different areas and come up with a calculation for the best overall noise reduction. This is not individualized noise reduction, right? It is not applying a different level of noise reduction to the skin, to the background, to the shirt. That comes later and that's a manual process but it has come up with a calculation that it believes to be the most uh, the be most beneficial overall. And well, I'm not gonna demo this now because it would take too long. What I did preparing for today was I went through and actually individually deleted, well, like I deleted all of the boxes except for one, like say the shirt, rendered that out. And then I did a box over just the skin tone and rendered that, and then just over the blue background and rendered that. And I compared those layers and in each one of those, there was some areas that looked better than others, but definitely without a doubt, when I looked at the one that was calculating all of them, so the automatic setting, there I got the best overall setting, the best looking skin tone overall, the best looking shirt overall, the best looking background overall. So it really is remarkable calculation that it's doing, and then it really does co compensate for or calculate everything in there, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, okay, so that said now if for whatever reason you want to change it like let's say that you think maybe it's it's chosen an area that you don't care about you don't want it to calculate that or it's big windstorm outside or it has grabbed an area that um you, that you feel is over kind of tweaking the algorithm one way or another you can move these around you can resize them to a degree they can't get super big you can delete them entirely i can just you know delete one on there and you can see this is now automatically got into a manual mode and so i can even add, add a new one i go no no i want it to grab there um you can do that as well and then once you do that you have to click on this measure noise you see it says right here profile needs to be updated you click on measure noise and it recalculates based off of all of those squares but again, I have, I don't think I've ever actually come across a situation where I needed to do it manually, just leaving it in automatic. Uh, let's just do a full reset on here, leaving it in automatic. Here it's going to analyze the image again, replace those squares, and um, give us a best possible result. So you see here it's chosen those same basic areas again. So at this point, let's just take a closer look at what we're actually getting in here. Let's zoom in to 100%. I'm going to go that split view. So we're seeing the same thing we saw earlier, but I just want to compare different parts of the scene. So let's uh, let's look at the background, for example. Uh, where's the background? Here it is. Okay, let that draw out. And there is a remarkable difference in the background on there, right? Pretty darn good. If we look at the skin tone, we again see a remarkable difference in the skin tone, but it's not it's not too much, right? Like the skin tone is not overdone. It is a nice balance. Now, when you look at that, you look at the background and think, well, I can get away with doing more noise reduction on the background than this. Uh, probably not anymore on the skin. And maybe I even want to scale it back a bit on the skin. Well, that's great. And that is what you can do. That is what the next tab is all about. The reduction tab where you can, well, first of all, you can just globally change it. So if I go, no, 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 I want the whole thing to be a little bit stronger. I can crank that up a little bit, but let's just do this. Let's take it up really, really high. And you'll see that sure the background becomes a believable soft background, but the skin tone is just gone completely mushy. And so that's definitely not going to work. So let me just reset that back to its uh, default setting. The real power here comes in using the control points. And before I jump into that, let me take a quick look at the questions again. There are currently over 500 people watching, so there is no way I'm gonna get to everybody's questions. So I think what that means is I am going to, um, just so I don't favor the people who asked early, I'm going to just kind of randomly click around and answer some questions. I apologize, it does mean I'm not gonna get to everybody's questions. But again, if you think of a question later you wanna hit me up with, um, I've already pasted, and I'll just do it again, pasted into the chat, my Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube channels 
uh, subscribe everywhere and follow me on, on Twitter and ask questions there and I will do my best to get to you. Um, uh, Philip Barker says, my images look ever sharp, ever sharp, Canon 5D Mark III, even raw with this help. Um, not quite sure what the question is, but awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Someone can't get sound. I hope someone can also can help them out with that. Um, which nine is the extra one in the link to register on Monday? The last nine, the very last digit, delete it and you should be good to go. And I went to the DXO website and used the link from there. Oh, did they finally update the website? That would be fantastic. Yesterday they hadn't. So that would be very, very good. Um, Ed Ramsey asks, do you sharpen before noise reduction? Okay, so this goes back to the same thing what I was saying earlier, where in the raw decoder, it has its own sharpening. It also has its own noise reduction. Do its default base there. If you're going to do additional sharpening, do that after. In fact, sharpening should generally happen last. So your workflow would be raw processing, noise reduction, secondary noise reduction, let's call it, um, effects, colors, whatever you're going to do, and then sharpening as a final stage. Sharpening should always be the last thing you do. Okay. All right, moving on back into here. So now let's get selective about it. Let me zoom back out and look at the whole image. There we go. And we have control points. Okay, so in case you're new to hold the whole DXO thing and the whole Nick plugin thing, what are control points? Control points are a way to create a mask, in this case, a mask for noise reduction, but it could be a mask for anything, depending on the plugin that you're in, to create a mask generated automatically based off of the luminance, the brightness level, and the chrominance, the color, of the area that you drop the control point onto. So imagine just in a really easy scenario, you've got a blue sky um, against a green mountain. If I drop a control point on that perfect blue sky, it is going to immediately mask out that blue sky flawlessly. It is a remarkable tool in how good it works. You drop it on the green mountains and it masks out the green mountains. Now you've got someone wearing a red and a green striped shirt, if you want to affect the whole shirt, you'd have to add two masks, one for the red stripe and one for the green, and it would get all of the red and the green stripes within its sphere of influence, what I like to call it, kind of its general area of, of effect. And that is something we have control over. So the way that it works is I drop a control point, I click on right here where it says add control point, I drop it down and I can change the size of that control point. And to see what is being affected, the way that you do it in this plugin is actually a little different than all the other ones. You'll notice there's no mask button here. Um, for every other tool, there's a mask button you can click on. I don't know why there isn't one here, there isn't. But the way that you do it is you hold down the command key either while you are changing the size of it or while you are moving it. And either way, you will get to see the mask as you do that, which I actually like a lot. Um, this is a feature that used to be in every Nick tool, and I hope it comes back because this is really awesome to be able to do. Um, anyway, so this, as you can see here, it is quite clearly got the background, right? That's done a great job of getting the background. If I make this circle big enough, it'll get the background on the other side, but you see with the spill, it's starting to get into the pants. So generally, if I wanted to mask out the background, I would put one over here, and then I would do another one on this side. And to do that other one, I could either option drag this to duplicate it or just drop another one. Now, I haven't done anything to it yet. Remember, we've got our base noise reduction that has happened over the whole image, and I am now going to add localized noise reduction, in this case, to the background. So let's go in nice and close again. Zoom in here and let's pan over so we can see the background area. This should be a good spot for this. In fact, you know, I'm going to do instead, let me just delete this one. I'm going to pan over to this side because I think it's a little easier to see on the bright part of his arm. Let's add that other control point into there. I guess I should zoom out of this and make sure that it is big enough. So let's grab that and make sure I'm getting the whole area there. There we go. Pretty good. So actually I can probably move this over a little bit and make sure that I get the background. There we go. That's pretty good. Good enough for this. Um, okay. So let me zoom back in. And what I want to do is reduce, come here you, oops, that would be the wrong tool. Zoom back out. Thank you. What I want to do is reduce the background noise reduction even more, or increase it even more. Anyway, left, right, we see the noise reduction that's being applied. Let me take this contrast noise slider and crank it all the way. We're going to go crazy. Take it all the way up to 200. The background has gotten super clean. Now, it also, because we've taken it up so far, you see these weird little artifacts start to show up. 
this is going to be very much image dependent, uh, but I think in general, if you crank it all the way up to the maximum setting, you're going to see some weird artifacting. So we've we've gone too far here, but that's okay. We'll dial it back later on. But the point is, look at how it has affected the background, but not the skin, right? The skin is untouched. The skin looks the same on the left and the right, um, but the background totally gone. Now I can you know, make that a little bit less, make it a little bit more gentle. There we go. I can do that um, or to find you know, whatever point I want. And actually, I think right about there is probably pretty good. Now, if I take this same control point and just move it over to the skin, then we're going to see it mask out and apply that noise reduction to the skin. And we can see this is clearly too much. It has completely obliterated the skin. It looks plastic and fake. This is not okay anymore. So this is why we are interested in this ability to separate the noise reduction, separate where we do it. So I have applied this to the background. Now, this isn't to say that we don't want to apply any to the skin. So let's apply some to the skin as well. I'll grab another control point, drop it on the skin, and this one I'm going to make a little bit less. Let's take it down to like 80-ish. And let's just get rid of the split view now and focus on the image itself. So now when I look at that image, we see a quite a clean background, a less noise reduced, for, reduced foreground. And essentially, this is all I have to do. I continue adding control points to the areas that I want to protect. And individually, I can adjust more or less control on them. Now, in this situation, let me zoom out of this for a moment. In this situation, the control point added to the skin, if I drag this around, you'll see that it is not getting the entire arm. Right? There's enough variation in the tonality of, of his arm that a single control point is not getting everything. So we see the kind of the main part of the of the uh, foreground. The forearm, remember that's the word I was looking for. The main part of his forearm is I go towards the edge, though. We get a little bit more on the edge there, kind of go into the shadows here. We get a little bit more down to the hand. I have to make a separate one down there. So I'd have to add a bunch of different control points here to really isolate out his hand. And that's fine, but there's another way to do this. There's another way to do your isolation. And before we get into that, let me just jump back into the questions real quick. So again, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna kind of randomly jump around through the questions um somebody else saying that i guess if the url thing for registering for mondays isn't work working for you then i'm sorry um wait for that new email to come i know it's going to come you will get one so i'm sorry i can't help you out with it. i guess i could if you stick around to the end i will pull the url for you and drop it into the chat uh, but i have to look it up so if you wait until the end i will do that okay uh let's see here um oh, i scrolled back here we go bob menick says all this is well and good, and it's a great app, and I've been using it for years, but how about support for 4K monitors? Um, it's basically unusable at this point. Okay, I totally get it. Uh, the current update, so Nick 2, added high DPI support. What you're talking about is high DPI support for a lot of the plugins. Define, unfortunately, was not in that batch. So I can't tell you because I don't know when that is going to get supported, but they are aware of it. And in fact, I would go as far as saying they are very well aware of the need if they were trying to brush it under the carpet they wouldn't have asked me to do a webinar on define they would have said let's just not talk about that but they didn't they asked me to do this one and so um so i know that they do care about it so um i know i know it's it's not ideal i know it's not ideal sorry about that guys um uh, Gary says, I like your workshops, but I use Nick with PhotoLab. I do not have Photoshop. Please try to use DXL products as much as possible. So um, fair, fair request, Gary. The reason that I don't is because I can do more things in Photoshop, hence the smart objects. But the, everything that I do in the Nick plugins is identical, right? It, it doesn't change at all depending on where I am. So I'm only doing it this way because I have the advantage of using the uh, the smart objects, the smart filters and smart objects, that's it, which is only going to come into play. Do I do that? Oh, I forget. I don't think I actually even do anything in there today. So I guess I could have done this all in the DXO one, but nothing I'm showing you today is something you couldn't do in the DXO. So you're, it's fair, fair. I probably should um, do that more. Okay. All right. Um, last one for now, Peter, or how much of this can be done in Lightroom rather than Photoshop? Um, all of it because we're talking about the plugin itself. Everything except for the raw, the multi-layered support, right? Obviously, you don't have that in Lightroom. But everything we're doing in the plugin, once you're in the plugin, you're in the plugin, and that is that. Okay. Oh, and someone has pasted the link in. Oh, excellent. Okay. Here. Perfect. I'm going to share this with the entire group. In fact, let me just make sure this is right before I do. Boom, boom, boom. There you go. This is the link I am pasting into the chat. Thank you very, very much, Tom. You are a star. Now I don't have to look it up. All right, guys, now let's get back into this. So 
<sighs> where was I? I want to do noise reduction. I'm going to do a full reset on this. Let's just re remove everything, remove all the control points, um, make sure my base measurement is back to automatic. Uh, yep, we're all good. Okay, so now instead of using control points, I'm going to use another feature in here called color ranges. And for noise reduction, color ranges is kind of better than control points. I mean, you know, there's individual situations, obviously. If you want to, color range is going to apply this to all colors in that range, hence the name. Control points are more precise, but color ranges in this case might be a little bit, give you a little bit more control. Anyway, up to you. So here's how it works. Go into color range. And by default, it just throws up a few random colors in here. doesn't matter because all of these are set at their neutral 100% position. But what I can do in here is I can go in and say, let's sample his skin tone. Click with the eyedropper, click on his skin tone. And I'm going to take the noise reduction of the skin tone down a little bit because I don't want it to be too heavy. And then I grab the eyedropper and click on the background in there. I can take the noise reduction way, way up. And we see, you can see in the preview right here, look, there's the background on there, just way, way up on there. Um, if I leave the skin tone on there is getting, well, I can make that more or less, but we're gonna make that a little bit less on there. So more skin, redu more skin reduction, more noise reduction happening on the background because it's blue than the, for than the skin because it's orangish. And let's do another eyedropper on the brown shirt. I guess I deselected that there we go on the brown shirt and the brown shirt I think we can get away with adding quite a bit so let's take that up quite a bit in there and what happened to my preview there we go Oop. preview come back click there it is nope <laughs> I don't know why it keeps going away all right there we go um and I can take the noise reduction up on that level pretty darn high in there so that's Right, that's pretty good, right? So we've got different noise reduction levels happening on the different color ranges. And this is where that whole color range part of it becomes really, really interesting because I can say, right, the background in this particular photo, the background is one consistent color, the skin tone is a pretty consistent color, the shirt's a consistent color, and I could add more. I can click on plus and I can add another one into there. So if I wanted to, let's say, do the guitar a little bit differently, and that's pretty close to the shirt color, so we may get some overlap in there, but I can actually just take that up a little bit. Um, I can do that as well. So, and just to reiterate what I said earlier, the noise reduction that I'm doing is entirely contrast noise because that's what you're seeing in the bottom right corner right now, that's contrast noise. Color noise is those speckles, those color noise speckles, which you almost never see anymore because modern raw processing is so good. But, uh, but if you did, then you could be working on eliminating that there as well. So that's how the color range part of it works, which is really, really cool. It gives you an incredible amount of control. Now to see exactly what is being affected, now let's go back up here to this viewing mode and switch to the contrast noise mask. And now we're seeing the noise applied based off of the color. So for example, the background in here where I've got it cranked all the way up or cranked high up, if I take that up more or less, we can see how much is going to be applied. So if I take it all the way down to zero, the noise reduction applied is pure black. That is a mask. That means no application of the noise reduction is getting through. Take it all the way to the right. It's white. All noise reduction is getting through. So this is also a way that you could refine your color. Now there is not a color range in here. There is a default range that's applied. It's obviously not a single pixel color in here, but I could even go in here and kind of move this around if I wanted to. I guess we don't see this update in real time, but apply that to try and find perhaps a slightly different color range or I could just go in here with the eyedropper, um, go back in and click different color ranges to see which, which one might get me more of that background being applied. So very, very powerful tool in there, really allows you to control what noise reduction is being applied where. We can see here, oh, we have a pretty good difference between the guitar, right? There's the guitar in there and the, um, the shirt. So pretty good, nice separation on that as well, at least for this brighter part of the guitar. And then the skin tone was being applied like so, so I want less, do I want more? How much of that do I want in there? And if I was to make all of these the same, right? If I made all of these the same, just to kind of really drive this point home, we would see essentially, because I've selected tones that represent the majority of the photo, we're seeing this mask being applied pretty much everywhere, meaning that this full on 200% noise reduction is being applied almost everywhere. Obviously not what we would want, um, So, but that's what that is telling us. So it's kind of interesting to be able to look at the mask view on that and see what is happening in there. Now we're not gonna see anything show up on a color noise mask because we haven't done the color noise, but if I started to play with these, because uh, I needed to, then I would, but that's why we're not seeing anything there right now. And that is everything in there. Let me check my notes real quick. I feel like I skipped something and then we're gonna move on to another photo. 
Um, oh, the negative control point. I didn't talk about that. So all a negative control point is, if we're back in the control points range, in, and by the way, when you switch to control points, it's one or the other, or, or switch, yeah, well, two control points or color ranges, it's one or the other, so you're not getting both of them, uh, just FYI. Okay, um, control point, right, so if I add a control point, it is adding this at 100%, you see where the slider is. If I add a negative control point, all that is actually doing is applying the control point with the contrast noise at 0%, you see it says no effect. There's no actual difference between a negative and a positive control point, just it's default setting. That's all that that is. Okay, that is everything that I wanted to show you in here. So I'm going to just do a whole other photo next, but before I do that, let's take a quick look at the questions, see if there's anything else I want to get to, and then we will move on. Um, what is the difference between the two slides in each color? Oh, I, the, no, the contrast versus the um, contrast noise versus color noise. If you don't know what I mean by color noise, if you if you've been around digital photography for a while, you get pretty familiar with looking at dark areas on high ISO pictures and you get these color speckles, bright green, bright pink usually, or magenta pixels that show up in there. Um, those would show up quite often in high ISO images back in the old days. Again, I don't even know if I have seen a single instance of that from a modern camera and modern software for years, but it used to happen that way a lot, so that's what that slider was for. Uh, can you, uh, Ernie says, can you sample multiple regions for the same control point? No, a control point is based off of the area that you click on. If you need multiple regions, you had multiple control points. So in the case of the arm, you would have a control point for the highlight of the arm and a control point for the shadow of the arm if one of them isn't quite getting it all. And the, then you would just set those uh, noise reduction levels the same or not. Uh, you could set them differently. If you want more noise reduction in the shadows, for example, than you want on the highlights of that arm, you could absolutely do that. All right, let me see if there's another question in here. Um, um, I'm not seeing anything else yet. Maybe I'm getting everybody's questions, which would be awesome um, if that was the case. Okay, let's, uh, was, oh, new picture, All right? Let me open another photo. This one is, here we go, picture of uh, this lovely little kitty cat um, in a zoo somewhere. Very, very high ISO. What is this? 16,000 ISO, so pretty darn high ISO. I'm pretty sure this was a Micro Four Thirds camera, so it's uh, kind of even noisier than you might expect on a full-frame camera at that 16,000 ISO. And if we look at this all close up, then we are clearly seeing a whole lot of noise in the background and everywhere else on here. All righty, so I am going to, um, let's see, everything's in range, not going to do any color effects here. Well, this is kind of an ugly color. Maybe I should do a White balance auto, let's see what happens. Nope, that didn't fix that at all, did it? I'm just gonna warm it up a little bit because it was offensively bad. There we go, that's better. And I'm going to open this as a smart object. So open that as a smart object and away we go. Now what I wanna show you next is a different approach to noise reduction. Going back to the original way that we looked at, where we're applying these kind of generic default noise reductions and then masking between them, combined with the more advanced noise reduction that we just did, but we're gonna put them both together. So we're gonna do both the advanced with masks. So now this is something that is a Photoshop specific capability. So uh, for those of you that aren't using Photoshop, this isn't something you can do in anything else because you need the layers, or at least nothing else that doesn't have layers. Uh, anyway, so let's, uh, let's move on. So let me jump into the Define plugin. I'm going to let it do its fully automatic dealio. Let's zoom out of this thing here. Give it a moment to analyze and apply that. Let's see if a new question has popped up while that's happening. Ernie Afton said, I should have said, oh, this is following up to the question about the control points. Can you sample multiple color regions to broaden the color range for a single control point? No, you cannot. A control point is only based off of that one area. Um, VP says, thanks for the explanation of the two sliders, looking uh, to expose some older pictures, so that would be helpful, reprocess some older pictures, that will be helpful. Yeah, I would, it'd be very interesting to see if you open an old digital photo from an old camera in new software, if you still see that noise speckling. Modern raw decoding is kind of crazy awesome. So anyway, uh, all right, so this has automatically applied to the photo. Zoom back out and we'll actually just do zoom in and let's take a close look at what we're getting on the background um, and on the fur on there looking pretty good oh i forgot an entire uh extra palette in here which is fine because i can show it to you here when you're in the reduce 
area, there's this hidden little more button. When you open that up, it's got three additional options in here. Edge preservation, JPEG artifact reduction, and D-banding. Edge preservation is the only one that is probably, well, that is gonna be useful for this photo and is um, gonna be very useful, I think. And that is basically edge protection for things like this little strand of hair here. So if I take the noise reduction way up on here, let's just take it up pretty high on this whole thing. Um, are we, why is it not applying a, do I have, re, oh, I have control points. That's odd where that came from. Maybe I accidentally clicked on one. Uh, there we go. All right, taking the noise reduction up, let's take it. Okay, something weird this way comes. What in the heckers is going on? It is, it's got one. All right, we're gonna do a full on reset of this. I don't know what happened in here. Measure noise. Maybe all that clicking back and forth was a bad idea while it was processing. How odd. It has only selected one area for noise reduction. That seems odd. Okay, well, hey, perfect example of why you might want to go manual. No, you silly software. I want you to analyze that range of the background, and I want you to analyze the cat's fur, and because it's funny, I want you to analyze the tongue as well. Cool. And we're going to make this box there a little bit bigger. All righty, now measure that noise. Oh, that's awful. Oh wait, it's because I have the noise reduction all the way up. Ha <laughs> ha, let's reset that back to 100. And you know, you could argue that it was better before and I should have just left well enough alone. I guess the software knew what it was doing because um, that, is, um, that is not so good. So let's just, let's just let it do what it does. Reset, fully automatic, yeah, full reset, measure the noise, let it do its thing. Yeah, sometimes the smarter, the software smarter than you are. What can I say? Okay, so it's done that. Now the problem I was having before, let's go back into this thing at 100%, is I was not getting that heavy noise reduction when I cranked it up here. So why is that? Very interesting. I cannot tell you what's happening in here. I swear it did not do this last night when I was setting this up. I don't know why it's doing such a like minimal noise reduction. That is very, very odd indeed. Well, I guess what I'm gonna have to do is I am going to manually apply at least one square because it seems to not be doing much noise reduction at all. Um, so let's just, oops, I didn't mean to reset, sorry. Let's just do the background on there. Let it do the noise reduction, measure that noise and try again. What's going on folks? This is the joys of live demonstrations. You never know what's gonna happen. Okay, reduce and let's go back in, zoom in close. And at this point, now we're getting that crazy heavy noise reduction on the background there um, and everywhere else. Okay, so this is basically where I wanted to be. That edge preservation that I wanted to show you, let's get back up to that edge, is I take this up higher and higher. We'll start to see, you can start to see the breakdown of the edge in there. You see it's kind of getting some weird little artifacting popping off of it. Edge preservation will aim to, as you might have guessed, preserve those edges. And you got to get it up pretty high to really see it. Um, and there's not a huge, huge difference, but if you do have really fine details like this whisker that are going weird, then this is a good tool to play with and see what you can get out of it. Um, underneath that is JPEG artifact reduction. This only applies if your source is a JPEG file. JPEGs being compressed sometimes have artifacts that can be exacerbated by noise reduction or sharpening. This will aim to reduce those. So if you're getting JPEG, if you're starting with a JPEG and you're seeing JPEG artifacting, hit that checkbox. There's, it's just a on and off box. There's no slider on it. So just see what happens. And then the D-banding is if you have a really big subtle gradient. Let's say you've got that perfect blue sky that is a very subtle gradient from you know, one shade of blue to another. When you get into noise reduction, you can introduce banding and this will aim to eliminate that. Um, it's kind of hard to imagine a scenario where that would show up because if you have that perfect blue, I mean, I guess if you had like a a high ISO late night sky where you've got that really dark blue gradation, um, you might start to see it there. So it, anyway, if you see banding, that's your friend right there. Hit that BD banding. Is it horizontal or vertical banding that you're getting? And off you go. Okay. So with that said, let's close this out and, um, and I'm going to apply this. Okay. I hit okay. Now this is too much, we already know this, on the uh, on the, the lion herself, himself, herself. That's a boy lion, I think. What do I know? Um, and I didn't ask. And 
we can see a good application of the noise reduction to the background. Let's zoom into that, but too much on the cat. So just like we saw before, we can mask that effect. Now, in this case, I can mask the effect itself as a smart filter, but that would bring us back to the default uh, photo without any effect applied at all, which might be okay. But what I really want to do is have multiple layers of the image. And I want to mask between those because even if I applied another smart filter in here, let's say that I applied a second define, I can't mask those individually. This mask right here applies to all of these smart filters. So if I want part of the image to have one level of denoise and part of the image to have another, I need to duplicate the image layer itself. So here's what I'll do. Let's rename this thing to background. And then I'm going to hit command J to duplicate that. And we're going to rename this to kitty. And I'm going to open the filter again by going back into define, double clicking on that, uh, that smart object there, smart filter. Let's pay attention to the fur and I'm going to take my level of noise reduction down quite a bit. Let's let it finish up. There we go. And sure, let's call it good. All right, that's cool. I'm going to go ahead and apply that. So now I've got two totally separate versions of the photo. I've got one that has the less noise reduction for the cat's fur and one that's got more noise reduction for the background. And if I toggle these on and off, uh, let me, let's just collapse this to make it a little easier to see. So top one is the cat background noise reduction, uh, the cat noise reduction. The bottom one is the background. As I toggle this on and off, you can pretty clearly see the difference in there, right? With the kitty layer active, I think the noise reduction on the cat's face is good. The background could have more. If I disable that top layer, we're seeing just my background. The background looks nice and clean, but the foreground, the cat is too much. So I want to mask this out. So with that layer selected, I'm not gonna use this mask because that would simply mask between the filter and the layer. I need to mask between this layer and the background layer. So I'm going to, with that mask selected, click on the mask icon, and now it's generating a mask for that. Remember, this is a separate mask from this one. Now I can grab my brush. So we've got the B for the brush tool. It is, um, it's already black. Um, actually, what I'll do is invert this mask. I'll hit select the mask and hit Command I. So is that what I want to do? Um, I'm looking at the foreground. No, I lied to you. Okay, I want to start with white, so we are not. I want to start with black. I know what I'm doing. Um, so we are going to protect the background. Is that how we're going to do it? Doesn't matter. Um, we are right now looking at, if I start masking this in with white, we are looking at brushing the top layer in so I can brush in the cat or brush in the background. I'm going to brush in the cat. So I just start moving this around. Let's zoom out a little bit. Start brushing in the cat layer in here. And I'm obviously not being very precise with this but that is okay. I'm just gonna brush that in. We can see over here the mask that is being brushed. So that's looking pretty good in there. And if I go in close, we see the difference between the cat it has one level of noise reduction, the background has the other. If I toggle that off, so far we've only brushed this edge. If I look at the whole mask, let's zoom out of this. I need to fill all this in with white. So let's just do that with the, um, the bucket tool. Where is the bucket? paint bucket tool, there we go. Um, fill it in with white, perfect, nice and easy. And so now I've got a layer that is just the cat. So there's my cat layer and a layer that is, well, it's the background, but it's actually everything. So in just the background. Now, if I wanted to get really precise in here, of course, I could go in here with a smaller brush tool and get in there and get very precise. And that would allow me to brush between those layers. But this is another way of going about doing it. So ultimately, you really got three, uh, three good approaches. Let's forget about the first thing that I showed you with the quick mask. Let's forget about that. So you have three good approaches to doing localized noise reduction. You can either use the control points inside of the plugin. You can use the color ranges inside of the plugin, or you can simply, if you're using Photoshop, do masks, do, uh, do multiple layers, I mean, and then mask between those. So you can get very precise by painting in and out between the different layers at any time. And of course, that's always there. So you can go back and change it at any time as well. Um, so those are kind of different approaches that you've got. And obviously, you can start combining things as well in there if you want to. Um, but that's everything that I wanted to show you today. So let me take a quick look back in the questions and see if there's anything else that I need to um, answer. And then, then we're going to wrap this thing up. Um, Ken Goldman says you can zoom in but can't zoom out again. Hold down the option key, and your magnifying glass will become a negative. It, I'll be honest, you saw me kind of fumbling a little bit in the tool. It seems like there are some click responses that it doesn't always register. Maybe I was moving too quickly for it. Um, it 
I, I don't know, it just was happening. So, uh, but in general, option key will convert the magnifying glass to a minus and you can zoom back up. Um, Charles Horton, how does this help star photos? Oh, astrophotography. That's a great question. I don't really do astrophotography. I don't have much experience in that, but I would say that you would have to be very careful because the stars could get treated as noise. I would say probably using the color range to select the black sky as opposed to the white stars would be a good way to do it. Probably be it because general overall noise reduction would just wipe out the stars, right? It would start to reduce those sinking their noise. Interesting question. Um, Janice says, I love that you're able to show us that even the experts struggle some days. Hey, I struggle every day. That's just part of the core, part for the course. <laughs> Kate Bader, which is better, this or DXL Lab 2 for noise? Good question. So this allows you a level of precision that you don't get in Photolab. Photolab prime noise reduction, however, is I think the best noise reduction in the industry. Um, it is, however, a global noise reduction. So, you know, if you if you really wanted to, if you wanted to have the absolute best, it doesn't matter how much effort it takes, I would say using prime noise reduction and layer masks like I did here. So you do one level of noise reduction for the background, one for the subject, one for the skin tone, one for the eyes, you know, and every single one brushing between them, that would give you the kind of ultimate but man, that'd be a lot of work. The control points that you have here give you that level of precision control. Um, the algorithm in Prime is, I believe, a better algorithm. That's where I can leave that. Um, keep in mind that if you're questioning, well, why isn't that algorithm in here? You have to remember that the Nick collection was originally owned by Nick Software. They're the ones who originally developed it, and then Google bought it. Google didn't do any development on it, uh, and then they just took code out of it and put it into apps like Snapseed on your phone. And then year-ish ago or whatever it was, DxO bought it from Google. And so now that DxO owns it, they have taken certain components of the tech out of the plugins and dropped them into the uh, into Photolab. They have taken elements of Photolab and dropped them into some of these plugins. And there is a lot going on behind the scenes as this is going to evolve down the road. Uh, but that's where we're at right now. And that's why you see this disparity in here because they originally were from two different companies and they're just like, they've come together about this much and there's a lot more that can happen and um, hopefully will. Uh, let's see, Dave asked basically the same questions so hopefully that helped answer yours. Um, oh, Andre says, is this webinar being recorded? I neglected to say that in the beginning, yes, you will get 24 hours after this webinar ends, a copy in an email in your inbox, obviously, um, that has a link to this webinar that you can watch. And it will also show up on YouTube, but that often takes a couple of weeks. Uh, Jorge says, do you think you can achieve similar results with Lightroom or Photoshop alone? No, because you don't have that level of control. You, If you want to get in there and be really precise about this region gets this level of noise reduction, this region gets another, then that's something that the plugin does that is unique. Uh, Janice says, is the color and constant range in Define 2 a better option than masking in Photoshop? A better option. It, it, it just depends on your photo, depends on the photo, depends on what kind of work you want to put into it. Uh, better is a really hard question. <laughs> there are different options, right? And this is part of why we have different options. If if one tool was the end-all be-all, then nobody would develop anything else. It would be pointless. But every tool has its inherent advantages and disadvantages. And so you need to find what works best for you and your workflow or your particular image, which is why it's beneficial to have lots of different tools at your disposal and to know them all so that when you are working on a photo, if you're not getting what you expect out of your default tool, you can get into the specialized tools, which is what this is all about. Uh, Let's see here. Someone else talking about use DxO next time. Okay, I will. Uh, Photoshop is useless to you. Again, the plugin, once you're in the plugin, it doesn't matter where you came from, it's all the same. Fred learned a lot. Thank you, I'm glad. Have you, how do you compare DxO and Photoshop? Um, kind of like comparing uh, uh, an apple to an orange, both delicious and totally different animals. Why well, I said animals there, but I did. Um, Let's see here, Bob Wayne, if you have universal noise reduction upon opening the picture in Define, can you then selectively remove the noise reduction with negative control points? Yeah, yeah, that's what that negative, that when you take it to zero, it's no reduction, it takes it back to its default status. Ray Nickel, do control points have a history option? No, they do not. 
When's the next webinar you're scheduled? Why was the next webinar you scheduled to do canceled? Oh, okay, James, uh, James Decker, it was not canceled. You were one of the lucky, unlucky third of people who got the email blast that got the wrong URL. I will paste the right URL again into the chat. That is the URL to register for Monday's webinar. That's the one that's black and white photos, black and white landscape. I think that's what it is. Um, it's just the, the URL that went out was wrong. So it's not canceled. It's still there. I just pasted that link in. I hope to see you there. Jane, we got, ooh, we're, we're at time. So I'm going to do, um, well, there's only a couple more questions. I'll finish these up. When finished adjustments, how do you save the image as a JPEG? Okay, well, if you're in Photoshop as I am, at this point, you would save, if I hit save right now, if I hit save right now, um, I can save this as a TIFF, which will maintain the layers, or as a Photoshop, but then if I wanted to export a JPEG, I would go in and do file, export, um, export as, and then go to choose a JPEG. If you're working in Photolab, then you have the export option from there. What you wouldn't want to do, unless you really didn't care to ever go back, is just save this as a JPEG and throw away the layers here, because the layers give you the flexibility to come back. But if you didn't need to, you could do that. Okay. Kathy, kind of late. Um, you'll know I'll wait for the replay. You will have to, I'm afraid. Jill Edwards, how do we get to selective tool in Photolab? In Photolab, you have um, a, uh, it's called selective, I think, uh, option, and it gives you control points, just like we saw in here, um, and brushes and other things. I'm not gonna get, I don't have time to go like do a demo on that, but it is there. Great info, color range is a great tip. Excellent, I'm glad that you like that. Um, whoever that was, sorry, I don't know where that, where that question went. Um, great info, Niall says, will this work the same in CS6? Yeah. The plugin should work in CS6, no problem. Will this be a YouTube video? Yes, Ed Ramsey, it will show up on YouTube eventually, but in 24 hours since you are here, you will get a copy of this in your inbox. Great job, Color Range is a great tip. I'm glad you enjoyed that, huge thanks. Julie, you are quite welcome, and that is that. Maybe I did get everybody's questions. Well, again, if you didn't get a question answered, by all means, head hit me up on Twitter, at Photo Joseph. I dropped the links into the chat room already. You can register for me uh, to follow me there and everywhere else, and that, my friends, is that. Thank you so much for tuning in today. That was awesome. That was a great audience. That was a huge audience. And, uh, and who knew there was that much interest in localized noise reduction. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And I will see hopefully all of you on Monday. Bye-bye.